in his mind, in his, uh, in his rules and laws, I should say, and uh, what he expects of us every day. Where would you know where you stood? We serve a great God, amen, a great, great God. We'll get to the, the message here in a minute, and then we got a lot of things to take care of today. We will uh, have a vote here after the morning service on the discussion we had last Sunday night. Uh, we'll take care of that. Tonight's service will be our quarterly business meeting. We do have a, at least one new item that will be coming up tonight. And so if you can make plans to be here, that would be great. Don't forget no Wednesday service this week. Uh, me and my bride's going to slide out uh, Wednesday uh, and, and go away for just a few days. We should be back, Lord willing, uh, the next Monday. And so uh, we'll be sliding away. So no service Wednesday night. And then I need to meet real quickly with the deacons right after the service. I'll promise you it will not take five minutes. Uh, we can just meet in my office real quick and uh, just got something need to go over with you. Won't take but just, I promise you, it won't take but just a minute. And uh, so before I get started, do you reckon Christopher would come up here with me? Christopher, would you come up here with me a minute? Everybody going, who's Christopher? Well, I'm going to introduce you to him. Him and his twin brother, Mikey. Mikey's back there. He's the spokesperson for the family. But we'll, uh, uh, this is Christopher Hannah, correct? Christopher Hannah. No, Christopher it, James Taylor. Christopher James. Christopher James. I'm sorry. Okay, we got that right. All right, they corrected me. So last Sunday morning, at the end of the service, he came and found me. And what did you ask me? Uh, can I get saved? He wanted to be saved. My <laughs> his mother told me uh, that for three weeks he had talked about the service I preached. For three weeks, she said, I've heard it over and over again. And he wanted to be saved. I went in detail with him about salvation, explaining to him what it was to be saved, explaining to him why we need to be saved and what needed to happen. And so he would make sure he understood. And I believe he did. And he prayed and asked the Lord to save him. And so we're thankful for that. Amen? So, amen. You can go back and be saved. Amen. As you can tell, both him and his brother are very shy. <laughs> I like them, amen. I like it that way. No, I really do. But it was my, my privilege, my honor last week to, to tell him about Jesus. And uh, he already knew from his family and, uh, and such, but uh, to lead him to the Lord, I guess, and just to uh, pray with him. And he prayed himself. And, uh, you know, when I've had the privilege of leading people to the Lord, and some very young some older, some middle-aged, and uh, what, is, what is fun, uh, not fun or funny, but what is uh, maybe different, I'm not finding the word I want, is when you get someone at his age, they have absolutely no problem praying for God to save them. They have absolutely no problem asking God to forgive them, saying it out loud, Lord, forgive me of my sins and save me. You get someone in their 20s, 30s, 40s, or 50, you got to pry the words out of them to get them to pray. Uh, I think that's because of where we're at in life, and we, we get ashamed of our sins over time, and we should be ashamed. We absolutely should be ashamed of our sins. Turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter number 18. Matthew, chapter number 18. But I want to tell you that because it's always a, a blessing around the house of God when someone gets saved. And uh, we can put that in the devil's face, amen. That's one you're not going to get. And, uh, and we got many more uh, that we're going to plead the blood over. And we just refuse to let the devil have them. Uh, I hope we've come here today with clear hearts and clear minds. And uh, come here for one purpose, and that's to, to praise and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And to learn more about Him through His Word and what He expects of us as children of God. If you're here, you're lost, need to be saved, uh, well then I pray that uh, you would follow in uh, young Christopher's footsteps and you'd find me and, uh, and allow, allow me to take the Word of God and tell you what it says about salvation and that's all that matters. So uh, my prayer today is that we will, I want you to listen to the Word of God. I will, I'm praying when you leave here that you will heed to the Word of God. And my biggest prayer is this morning is that I would communicate what I'm trying to say in the manner of which I want to say it. Uh, and it's an extremely important message, and I think it will help all of us 
And let me say this too, it's an extremely difficult message. It's a difficult message to implement on our behalf, as far as myself personally, as well as yourself. And so I want to preach out of Matthew chapter number 18. I'm going to read here in a moment, verses 21 through 35. We're going to preach on this subject, forgiveness. Forgiveness. Probably one of the most difficult things the Word of God asks us to do. Forgive. Why? Because it goes against every fiber of our being. Doug does me wrong. My flesh does not say forgive Doug. My flesh says to avenge that wrong by coming at Doug. We want to, uh, we want to take care of those things ourselves. The hardest thing for us to do is to forgive someone and ask Jesus to take care of the situation. Well, preacher, if I forgive them and I allow them back in, well, then they're just liable to do it to me again. And then you know what you're supposed to do? Forgive them again. Amen? Forgive them again. And I got some things I want to talk to you about forgiveness. And I hope when we get done that we will have a better understanding of what forgiveness is and what it means and what it doesn't. Uh, and, and what it doesn't mean is just as, as crucial as what it does mean. But I believe it will help us as a church, help us as individual. Would you not agree with me that the very... Uh, the very core of the gospel is based around forgiveness. Christ came and died on a rugged cross. It was love, as the song just said, uh, that, that moved him in compassion to come and die on the rugged cross. But he died that our sins could be forgiven. And therefore, we need to be forgiven by God and we need to forgive one another. I hope to touch on both of those uh, aspects this morning, if at all possible. God forgives us, and because of that, He commands us to forgive one another. Again, the word Christian. If I said who in here is a Christian, most of you, if not everyone, would raise their hand. The very definition of Christian is to be Christ-like. Nothing is more Christ-like than loving your enemies and forgiving those that have done you wrong. This puts me and you on the scale, lets us know how close we are to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read you about three scriptures before I get to the text. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 says this, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Luke 6, 37. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Colossians 3, 13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Those are pretty self-explanatory, aren't they? Uh, I should be able to shut my Bible and say, let's practice that and go home. No, I'm not going to. Amen? Don't get excited. So forgiveness is mandatory. Mandatory according to the Word of God. It is mandatory that we forgive one another. If you've been forgiven by God, it is commanded of you in the Word of God by the Lord Jesus Christ that you find it in your heart to forgive one another. The Bible goes on to say, and we'll talk about it later, that if, if we don't forgive one another, then the Heavenly Father won't forgive us. So what does that mean? Does that mean if we're saved by the grace of God, and then we have hard hearts and we don't forgive one another, that God's going to pull back His salvation? That's not what it means at all. You mean you believe once saved, always saved? You know I do. Amen? You get in the family of God, you're in there. And ain't nothing you can do or every devil in hell can do to get you out of God's hand. However... We can damage our testimony and we can sever that closeness, that relationship that we need with God and, and that, so that when we pray, we know God's ear is turned our way and He hears and He answers our prayers. We must forgive one another. We must. So let's look at these verses. I think these verses are very telling, very telling. Let's read them and then we'll, we'll move on a little bit. Starting in verse number 21, the Bible says this, Then came Peter to him and said, 
So here's Peter. He's going to ask the Lord a legitimate question. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. I'll explain to you why I think he said seven times in a moment. Till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say unto thee, until seven times. Not uh, until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now let me say there before I go on. You may say, well, 70 times 7, let's see, 490, right? So I can take a piece of paper, put four little marks this way, one that way, and that's five, and I'll keep track of how many times Doug does me wrong. And when I get to 490, he's had it. That's not what it means at all. It doesn't mean you have a right to keep score. It means an infinite number you're supposed to forgive, amen? You're supposed to forgive. So let me move on. Verse 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. For as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant there, therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord... Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying have patience with me and I will pay thee all and he would not but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt so when his fellow servants saw what was done they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done then his Lord after that he had called him said unto him O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have been com had, had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I pity on thee, had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Lord, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be here today. Lord, I pray now as we try to expound and look at these scriptures, Lord, I pray that you'd pierce our stony hearts. Uh, Lord, we probably all have someone in our lives that we think of uh, that has done us wrong, that has made us mad, Lord, that we feel like has, has said or done something unjustifiable against us, that has caused us trouble and heartache. And Lord, we find it very, very difficult to come to that place of forgiveness uh, where we can forget and not hold that against our brother, not hold that, Lord, and, and bring that up, Lord God, but we would let that go, that we could have the peace in our hearts of knowing we've forgiven those that have wronged us. Father, I just pray today that you'd give us that understanding. You'd help us to search our hearts. You'd help us to do that which would be your will. Father, what our church could be if we could just come to the point where we could forgive not only one another, but ourselves. Father, I thank you and I love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So we want to try to look at some of these scriptures here and try to expound upon them and try to uh, relate them to everyday life today. I don't know how many of you might know a man by the name of Carl Menninger. He is referred to as the father of psychiatry. He made this statement. He said that if he could convince the patients in his psychiatric hospitals that their sins are forgiven, 75% of them could walk out the next day. Why would you say that? Because harboring ill will will cause you nothing but heartache and trouble. Amen? There is liberty in forgiveness. 
There is bondage in holding, uh, holding a grudge against someone. It places you in jail. It places you in bondage. And 90% of the time, the person that you're unforgiving towards uh, doesn't even realize it. They're not upset. Uh, they may not even know they made you mad. But we place ourselves under bondage when we refuse to forgive one another. There's great liberty in forgiveness, church. Great liberty in forgiveness. So I want us to look at about five things. And I'm going to try to move through these scriptures if I possibly can as we look at these things. Before we begin, let's go back to our text. And let's see here. And, and start in verse number 21. Then, then came Peter unto him. And he asked a very legitimate question here. He knew that he must forgive. He learned that back in Matthew chapter number 6 uh, when the Lord told him in verses, I believe it's 16 through 18, uh, that they must forgive their brothers. He, he knew he had to forgive, but it's a legitimate question. So how many times should I forgive? How often should I forgive? Well, the Bible will teach you and I, uh, and, and history will teach you and I, that according to the, uh, the, the system in, placed in that day by the rabbis, you were under obligation to forgive three times. Three times. They got that from the book of Amos. And I got that written down somewhere, but I don't know exactly where it's at on here. They got that from the book of Amos, chapter, well, through most of the first three or four chapters. It says many times, for three transgressions. And then it says, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. So God was saying, I'll forgive the first three transgressions. But the fourth one, I'm not going to turn the punishment away. They used that as an opportunity to say you forgive three times. But after that, Katie bar the door. After that, all's fair in love and war, as we say today. So Peter asked this question. He just simply wants to know. Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Then he says seven times. Well, he's taken three, he's doubled it, and he's added another one for good measure. He probably thought Jesus would be very impressed with his, with his uh, confession that he's willing to forgive seven times. I'm willing to do twice what the rabbis say I should do, and I'll throw in an extra one just for good measure. Boy, he probably expected the Lord to praise him for that. Peter, that's wonderful. You're where you should be. You've been listening to me, Peter. Uh, you've got my love in your heart that you can forgive someone seven times. But I'm sure he was very surprised when Jesus said seven times? No. Till seven times 70. Meaning as many times as necessary. As many times as your brother uh, does wrong to you, you have to forgive him. That's what Christ is telling him. Let me look on just a little bit here. Jesus said to him, not until, seven, uh, not until the seven, until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven. All right, I'm going to stop there for a moment, then we'll come back to these scriptures. But I want you to know the word of God gives several uh, examples of people uh, that have been wronged and have been wronged in a tremendous uh, way and yet they have found forgiveness in their hearts. And so God is not asking you to do something, number one, that he didn't do. Number one, you've, your sins against God, and I'll probably say this more than one time today, the sins against, from you that you have committed against a holy God are much greater than any sin someone could commit against you. So the sins we've committed against God are of much greater stature than those that are committed against us. So if God could forgive our sins, how can we not find it in our heart to forgive others that have sinned against us? That's what he's saying. But the Bible gives us many examples. And I'm just going to go through these real quick here. In Genesis th chapter 13, 14, we find uh, Abraham and Lot. Abraham and Lot had to separate ways because there was strife among, among their servants because they both got so large. God had blessed them so much. What does Lot do? Lot picks the, uh, the green plains of Sodom. They go out. Next thing we know, Lot here, he's been, uh, he's been taken captive. And what does Abraham do after Lot wrongs him at every turn? He goes and rescues him. He forgives him. He didn't say, well, Lot's getting what he deserved. He shouldn't have acted that way. We read in Genesis chapter 37 pretty much through the end of the book, end of Genesis. We read about Joseph and his brothers. You know the story there. Joseph, uh, his brothers hated Joseph. He revealed his dream that God gave him. They hated Joseph. They hated him. His dad gave him a coat of many colors. They despised him. What did they do? They took him and sold him into slavery. He goes into Potiphar's home. He ends up in jail. And then he's second in command over all Egypt. 
And then you know who's standing in front of him? His brothers. And they don't recognize him. And Joseph had the authority, he had the right, he had the ability to have every one of them cast into prison or their lives taken from them. But did he do that? No. He played a little bit of a shell game to get his younger brother that he loved there. And then he played a little more and got the father there. He revealed who he was and they were terrified because they knew what they'd done to Joseph. And they knew where their hearts would be, but not Joseph. Joseph said, what you meant to be harm to me, God meant to be good. And I know that wasn't exact, but that's paraphrasing. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. And God took what those mean brothers did to him and turned it around that he could save his whole family from famine, from starvation. Great example. We also read in Luke chapter 22 to get in the New Testament. We read there about uh, the one we're talking about here, Peter. And Peter said, Lord, all other men might fail you, but not me. I would never deny you. Though others would, not me. And Christ said before the cock crow twice, you'll deny me thrice. And Peter, oh, no, 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 no. And we know that Peter was out warming himself by the world's fire. Christ is being led to the cross. Christ looks out. And Christ hears the cock crow twice. Peter denied him for the third time. Not me. The Bible said he began to, uh, to use violent language and curse. Not me. I'm not a Galilean. You didn't see me with him. I got no part with that man. Denied him three times. And yet it was just the next a chapter or so that Jesus says, Go tell the disciples and Peter. Jesus forgave him of denying him on the day that Christ would give his life, being led to a rugged cross, and yet he forgave Peter. You and I should be able to forgive one another. I want to read you another. I've got about three quotes that I want to read you, or, and this is the second one. And this is actually not a quote. It's a story. But it's a story about Louis XII of France. After he ascended the throne, he had enemies that had him cast into jail, and after he ascended the throne, before coming to power, he had been cast into prison and kept in chains. Later, when he did become king, he was urged to seek revenge, but he refused. Instead, he prepared a scroll on which he listed all who had perpetrated crimes against him. Now, if the king is putting together a list of everyone that's wronged him, you don't want to be on that list, do you? So, let me finish. He put everybody's name on that list that perpetrated crimes against him. Behind every man's name, he placed a cross in red ink. When the guilty heard about this, they feared for their lives and fled. Then the king explained, The cross which I drew beside each name was not a sign, but a sign of punishment, but a pledge of forgiveness extended for the sake of the crucified Savior, who upon his cross forgave his enemies and prayed for them. You see, he marked them. He marked every one of them, but not for revenge. He marked them to pray for them and to forgive them as Christ had forgiven him. You and I need to do the same. We need, and I'm sure we could all have stories. Now, you probably don't have enemies that have cast you into prison. But we have people that have done us wrong, come upon us and done things that we find horrible and they should have never done. And if we want to be honest, we've probably done the same to someone else. And we need the forgiveness of others as much as we need to forgive those that have wronged us. But we need to mark those names. Not for revenge. Not so we can get even. Not so we can tell others. Not so they don't forget what they've done but so you and I can forgive them. We've all been wrong. So there's some great illustrations there. Now I want to see what Jesus' word here has to say about forgiveness here. As I said, Peter asked this very significant question. I explained to you the, uh, the, the law there according to the rabbis and three times, and, and they got that from Amos, and, and Peter adds another one. But look what the Bible says here. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon... Uh, well, I want to see. Wait now. Let's back up here a second. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which would take account of his servants. What does that mean? That means he kept up with them. He kept a tally. Can I say this, that the king here representing God, that God keeps a running record of your sins? He has a tally. 
And if we don't ask for forgiveness, that tally is going to be held against us. So God keeps a record. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Well, how much is that? I'm going to read you the footnote in my Bible. I'm going to read it to you verbatim. How much is that? The 10,000 talents was more money than was circulating in all of Israel. The talent was the largest unit of currency equivalent to approximately 6,000 days wages. And 10,000 is the highest single number that can be expressed in Greek. The sum represents the sinner's hopeless debt to God. Selling the, de- uh, selling the debtor, his family and possessions would hardly begin to recoup this debt. Forgiving such a loan is an astounding act of grace. So now let me continue. And then the Bible said, for as much, verse 25, for as much as he had to pay his Lord, commanded him to be sold, his wife, his children, all that he had and payment to be made, which he could never meet that payment. You and I could never do enough to meet the payment of our sins. Next verse. The servant therefore fell down, worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. I want you to see something there. First of all, he knows he cannot pay his debt. He knows he owes the debt. The servant never one time contests the debt. He knows he owes a debt to the king. He knows he cannot pay the debt. He's not running from it. So what does he do? He begs for time. He begs for patience. He begs his Lord to to give him time to try to raise the money, knowing he could never raise enough to meet this debt. But I want us to understand something here when it comes to our salvation. Do not mistake God's patience and God's long-suffering as forgiveness. Just because God has not judged you for your sins as of yet, do not take that as God has forgiven or look past your sins. Say amen. Every sin will be brought into account before a holy God. When we get saved by the grace of God and we say, Lord, come into my heart and life, forgive me of my sins, He wipes that sin that clean. We can't work hard enough. He wipes that sin debt clean. Let me move on. The servant, uh, he says, uh, and payment is made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. He knew he couldn't. The Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Every bit of the debt forgiven. Aren't you glad when you got saved by the grace of God that your sin debt was wiped clean? I stand before you today in the eyes of God sinless. Not because of me, but because of what Jesus did for me on Calvary. And when God looks at me, he looks at me through the lens of Christ's blood and he sees me, not as I am, not as I was, but who I'm going to be when I get there. I am so thankful my sins have been forgiven. So, I want to read you that note. I'm going to give you one more quote here before I move on. This will be the last quote I believe that I have. This is by Sir Walter Scott talking about forgiveness. And I, I, this really put things in perspective for me too. I might have read this before. I know I... I've read this in the past. He was a, a novelist, a Scottish novelist, and his story. And I want you to listen to what he said. He says he had difficulty with the idea of turning the other cheek. Who doesn't? That's hard, isn't it? He had difficulty with the idea of turning the other cheek. But Jesus' words took on a special meaning one day uh, when Sir Walter Scott threw a rock at a stray dog to chase it away. His aim was straighter and his delivery stronger than he had intended. For he hit the animal and broke its leg. Instead of running off, the dog limped over to him and licked his hand. Sir Walter never forgot that touching response. He said, that dog preached the Sermon on the Mount to me as few ministers have ever presented it. Scott said he had not found human beings so ready to forgive their enemies. Jesus' way means forgiveness is not an option. That's the way you and I should be. Amen? We need to forgive when we are done wrong. How many has been done wrong? Raise your hand. Amen. Now, raise your hand. How many has done others wrong? Hey, 
Well, you're being honest anyway, amen? Or I guilted you, shamed you into it, one. Third thing I want us to see is the gravity that, that Christ places on forgiveness. Every time Christ had opportunity, he spoke about forgiveness because it is one of the most difficult things that there is for you and I to do. Uh, we, it's easy to write someone off. It's easy to say, I'm done with this person. I'm done with that person. Uh, they shouldn't have done this. They've done this. You don't know what they've done to me. I don't care what they've done to you. Uh, the Bible does not teach us to write people off. The Bible does not teach us to look for vengeance and avenge one another. The Bible teaches you and I to forgive one another and to forgive our enemies. We might even find it in our hearts to forgive one another at times. But our enemies, those that hate us, the Bible tells us to forgive. So he did take every opportunity. He, he, in Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, he taught us how to pray. He told us then that we need to ask forgiveness. He said, if, if, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive me, not men their trespass, trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Doesn't get much clearer than that, does it? That's not hard to understand. Not hard to understand at all. So let's look at some results here. If you do or don't forgive, does it really make a difference? Preacher, you'll never know whether I forgive you or whether I don't. No one else knows I'm holding a grudge towards so-and-so down the pew. So does it really matter if I forgive them or if I don't? What does it really matter? Nobody knows. Well, when we look at this story here, and with this parable that Christ gave to Peter and to us here in the Word of God, what we find is the king that forgave him a debt he could never pay. And yet when he was owed, and I'm going to read you more from, uh, from my uh, Bible here. Let me read verse 28 and 29. But the same servant, the one that was just forgiven all his debt, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Now, my Bible says this. A hundred pence, which was a denarii, was equivalent to three months' wages. The contrast between the 10,000 talents... And the hundred denarii shows that the sins of others against us are trivial in comparison to the enormity of our own sins against God. So he was forgiven for a debt that was so large he could not pay. And yet the first thing he does is run out and find a peer, one of his fellow servants that owed him a minute amount and he not only just demanded he pay him, but he took him by the throat and he's choking him and saying, give me my money or I'll put you in prison. And he has him thrown in jail until he could make the debt in full. Which doesn't make any sense. Because if he's in jail, he's not earning any money. I've told you before, me and Karen like to watch some of those crime mysteries at times. And sometimes you'll see a, a, a bookie or someone that's owed a big, big amount of money, and the person that owes them shows up dead, and they go to them and say, they owed you all this money, so you killed them. And they all say the same thing. What good is he dead to me? I can't collect money from a dead man. If this man had been thinking, he'd have said the same thing. Why cast him into prison? He had just been extended so much grace, so much mercy, so much forgiveness, and yet when it comes to someone that owed him a minute amount... He couldn't find forgiveness in his heart. He couldn't do it. God help us to forgive. So we see here. Are you and I tied up with, in unforgiveness or are we willing to forgive people? My last point, and I'm trying to hurry because we got things to do. But I want you to get this last point. And this I want to spend a little bit of time on. How difficult it is to forgive. Difficult. I understand that it's extremely hard. In fact, can I go one step further and say this? Forgiveness is not only hard, it is impossible in the flesh. It is impossible for you and I to find the forgiveness in our heart outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, plain and simple. 
He must be the one to initiate the forgiveness. So I want us to understand, first of all, I don't want us to misunderstand, maybe I should say, what forgiveness is. To forgive someone is not to condone their actions. So if Doug does me wrong, I'm on Doug today, I know. Have you done me wrong? <laughs> if Doug has done me wrong, when I forgive Doug, I'm not condoning, I'm not saying it's okay what you did. I'm not saying I don't care what you did. I'm simply saying you did me wrong, but I'm going to find it in my heart to forgive you for what you did. I'm in no way saying it was okay. I'm in no way saying it's right. I'm in no way saying you have a right to do it again. I'm simply saying, I forgive you. I forgive you. So what is forgiveness? Forgiveness for you and I is giving up our right to, and, and our desire to get even. That's what it is. You know, when someone does you wrong, first thing you do, I'll get even for that. Amen? Uh, we have this little thing, and I struggle with it at times. I'm going to confess. I'm being honest. Uh, it, it's tagged as road rage. I don't institute. But when someone runs me off the road for no reason, forgiveness is not the first thing that comes in my mind. I'm being honest. Amen? And I have to stop and calm down. <laughs> I bad tell on myself. So, Saturday morning, I'm going through Mooresville. You want to get mad? Drive through Mooresville. I'm going through Mooresville. I'm on the phone with my cousin. He says, hold on a minute. So now there's dead time. I forgot I was on the phone. The man cut me off. I mean, put me, run me off the road, put me, cutting me off. I yelled at the top of my lungs in my car by myself, Are you stupid? My cousin said, Go get him, boy. <laughs> I forgot he was on the phone. I honestly forgot anybody was on the phone. I said, I'm sorry. Man just cut me off. He said, I understand. And he's dying laughing at me. And I laugh at myself. I know you would never do that, would you? No, not you. Y'all are much better people than I am. So it's just releasing our right to get even. Now, I'm going to make another statement. Until you and I truly experience the forgiveness of God, we are truly unable to forgive others. We have to experience the forgiveness of God in our hearts before we can forgive others others just like we truly don't know what love is until we experience the love of God you think you do but we don't until we experience the love of God now as I said forgiveness is is freeing it's healing it's restoring forgive me for an example here Earl come here Keith come here please Doug come up here come here Will Come here, Sarah. I need to throw a little girl in here. All right. This is all the friends I've gotten. This will come up here around me here. here. They don't want to see you. I'll look at you. This is all the friends I've got in the world. So I know Keith said something and done something that he shouldn't have. So I'm done with him. You can go sit down. I'm done. I'm done with him. I ain't forgiving him. And Earl, everybody knows what Earl's like. I, I'm tired of Earl. I'm tired of asking him to forget. He's out of my life. And everybody knows how ugly Will can be at times. I mean, look, look at that face. I mean, he's been, he said some cruel things. I'm not forgiving him, not the way he's treated me. And Doug, I've told you all day that he's been trouble. I'm not forgiving him either. Go sit down. When we choose not to forgive, I kept you up here because you're the prettiest. When we choose not to forgive, our world gets smaller. This is the only friend I have left. Our world gets a whole lot smaller. But when we find it in our heart to forgive one another, not to condone, but to forgive, then our world expands. And we get new friends. 
And we have new opportunities. Opportunities to share Christ. Opportunities to, to be happy. You can go sit down. Thank you. When we, when we refuse to forgive people, our world just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller until we're the only ones left that can stand ourselves. And now tell me who's in bad shape and who's wrong. We have to learn to forgive. We have to learn to forgive. I lied a minute ago. I said I was done with my quotes. I have one more. One more. And this, this is so relevant to what I just said, I believe. A Dutch author by the name of Corrie Ten Boom. She is the author of the book The Hiding Place. She was in the concentration camps in Germany uh, during the Holocaust period. I want to read to you, uh, this is an excerpt from her book. It said, it was a church service in Munich that I saw him, the former guard who had stood guard at the shower room door in the processing center at Ravenbrook. So she is at a church service. She was speaking at a church service. She sees this man that was the prison guard at the showers that had treated them poorly, that had taken her modesty away during, in the concentration camps. Listen to what it says. He was the first of our actual jailers that I'd seen since that time. And suddenly it was all there. The room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, Betsy's, which was her sister, pain blanched face. He came up to me as the church was empty and beaming and, bow, and, and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, Frawling. He said, to think that as you say, he has washed away my sins. His hand was thrust out to shake mine. And I, who had spoken so often to the people in Blomendal, to the need to forgive, kept my hand by my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled within me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me. And help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing. Not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again I breathed the silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder along my arm through, uh, and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with command, the love itself. I thought that was tremendous. How difficult, can you imagine? You think you've been wronged. I've never been wrong to compare what she just said happened to her. And yet, because of the love of Christ and Christ working through her, she could forgive him. And you can read more in the book. It's very interesting. So the Bible teaches us to love one another, and that, that includes our enemies, amen? Not just, not just others. I'm going to give you four quick things, and I'm closing. And I'm doing good. Four quick things. In Luke chapter 23, I want to turn there. Luke chapter 23, I should have marked it. Verse number 32 through 37. I'll read those and I'll we'll give you these four things. 23, 32 through 37, the Bible says this. And there were also two other male factors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors on the right hand and the other on the left. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. Back up to verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Roman soldiers. The ones that just nailed him to a rugged cross. How do you know that's who he's talking to? Because it says, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. And that's what the Roman soldiers did. And those that crucified Christ 
He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So I'm going to give you these four things. Number one, forgiveness begins with prayer. You'll never forgive someone until you go to prayer in God to help you to forgive them. Just saying, I forgive you, carries no water. Anyone can say that. It's like saying, I love you, if you don't show your love by actions. Number two, you cannot wait on or expect people to understand how much they've hurt you. As I said, Doug's been doing me wrong all service. And he doesn't even realize it. He will never understand how he hurt me, how much he hurt me. I cannot expect him to understand that. I cannot try to pile in his head, you don't understand why I'm mad. It's because you did this, this, and this. You don't understand how I feel. He never will. But that is not a prerequisite to forgiving someone. You cannot wait on them to understand how they hurt you. In fact, he'd probably look at me and say, I don't understand what you're so upset about. I didn't mean, I was just joking. I didn't mean that. You're, you're reading more into it. You took it the wrong way. He'll never understand how he hurt me. But I still have to forgive him. The third thing that we need to realize is no one is beyond God's grace and forgiveness. Well, you don't know. I know this guy down the street. He lives down here about the fourth house, da 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 You don't know what that guy has done in his past. I knew him back before he got saved. Let me tell you what he'd done. I got a better idea. Don't tell me what he'd done. Amen? Just don't tell me. Because God's grace and God's mercy and God's forgiveness can reach the most vilest of sinners. You better be thankful it could. Amen? I'm thankful. And the last thing is people's past needs to stay in the past. We don't need to be drudging all that up and drag it up against someone. Every time, they get up, every time you get upset, they get mad. Or you get mad. You don't need to be bringing somebody's past up against them. If God's forgiven and God's forgot it, we need to forgive also. I understand we're not able to forget. But we are able not to bring those things up. And if we've truly forgiven someone, we won't. So forgiveness is difficult, but it's mandatory according to God's law. It is mandatory if you and I want to have a victorious, God-pleasing life. It's mandatory. Christ teaches us there's no need to come to God and pray for the things you have need of if you have unforgiveness in your heart. We must get those things straightened out first. Amen? Let's all stand just a moment. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. I know this wasn't a shouting message today. Knew it wouldn't be. But it is a message that if we'd heed to it, we would have a better, we'd be, we could become a shouting. Uh, we could shout more, I should say, if we get to that place. We can have a more victorious life. While Brother Dean plays just for a moment, I don't know your heart, and I don't know, you, I don't know what's going on in your life. You might have someone that you need to extend forgiveness to. And God's brought them to your mind. And you know right now, preacher, I'm just not ready. I'd get ready. I'd come to the place you need to come to the altar and ask God, God, give me what I need. Give me your power, your spirit, your help to forgive. Only he can. I'm not going to prolong the service. But while we wait just a moment, is there one who would be honest? Preacher, I've got some enemies. I've got some that have wronged me in the church, out of the church. I don't know where. It doesn't matter where. I just need to make things right. I want to do so. Would you be honest? Father God, we thank you for the privilege to be here this morning. I'm thankful, Lord God, for the lessons that the Word of God teaches. And Lord, I pray that you'd help me and everyone else within this church, Lord, to seek you in prayer for forgiveness for those that have done us wrong. It's easy, Lord God, to sit back and say, I can forgive for this or this or this, but not that. It's easy to say people just don't understand what they did or how bad they hurt me or, or this or whatever the case may be, Lord, and use that as an excuse not to forgive. But you don't give us that luxury in the Word of God. You simply told us to forgive. You simply told us to forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ. You told us to forgive our enemies. I know it's not easy, but I also know with the help of God we can do that very thing. And what liberty we can feel in our lives. Father, I thank you for forgiving me. 
In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be.